Good morning, everyone. So we're now ready to uh, start the second bill, but as you see, we're putting up on the screen again, since um, a number of people um, had started joining in at the latter part of the first bill. So uh, what you have before you are basically some public testimony directions that we um, share at the beginning of every uh, hearing. And I'll just run through those quickly. Uh, the committee staff will coordinate the public testimony. So please be patient with that. If you're connecting online, please use uh, the raised hand function to indicate that you wish to testify. Each speaker must state their name prior to speaking. Uh, users who call in can uh, cannot be identified by name and will be unmuted by the host one by one. So if you do not wish to testify, please just say so when you're unmuted. And then attendees will hear two beeps when they are unmuted. State your name at the beginning of your testimony. If a speaker is inaudible, they will be directed to call back and provide their testimony in a chat function. So with that, we'll move on to uh, City Council Bill 20-0205R, and this is an informational hearing for the implementation of the Water Accountability Act for the purpose of inviting representatives from the Department of Finance and the Department of Public Works to provide the City Council with an update on the administration's progress implementing the Water Accountability and Equity Act. This bill was introduced on March 9th of 2020. The bill was sponsored by President Brandon Scott. And um, as, we, as you all know, the uh, bill itself was um, heard by the council and moved on to the mayor and he signed the bill and uh, the bill is now law and now we'll hear from the sponsor of the bill which is uh council president scott you're on thank you uh thank you madam vice president and thank you everyone for being here albeit virtually and first and foremost i hope that everyone is safe and healthy and i hope the same is for your family and the residents as well I'm excited to join you guys today to talk about the discussion of the implementation of this critical bill that will not only make water affordable uh, for our, our residents, but also accessible to them, and that will also increase transparency in the billing process. But I'm still disappointed uh, that the legislation was necessary to begin with. Uh, clean and affordable water should have never been an issue for any of any Baltimorean, period. When we last talked about this, uh, uh, I talked about how we were dealing with the implementation of this in addition to uh, the continuing violence epidemic in the city in Baltimore, but now we also have the COVID-19 crisis. And we know, uh, we talking about how this is impacting everyone and how our residents are living uh, with uh, the fact of even more trauma now, worry about where their uh, next paycheck is gonna come from has only increased in the, in the last two, two months. All of these pressing issues not only still exist, but have heightened uh, due to this health pandemic, the need. And once again, uh, DPW, unfortunately we've seen, I was unable to issue some water bills for a short period of time uh, due to the work from home order. Residents will receive water bills in May that are larger than normal to cover March and April. We know this is not a situation that is uh, tenable for most of our residents in Baltimore. And I said this in March and I'll say it again, the government is supposed to represent, protect, and fight uh, for the residents of Baltimore. But if we can't even figure out how to send an accurate water bill, if one at all, how can we understand, uh, uh, say that we're doing that? Uh, that's unacceptable. And this is exactly why the city council fought so hard, hand in hand, side by side with the community to get this piece of legislation passed in the first place. And now uh, we know that we must do better. And we want to hear today about how this legislation is going to be implemented. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you. And uh, I want to acknowledge we have uh, uh, Councilman Bill Henry that has joined us. And we also and we also have from the Department of Public Works, uh, 
Matt uh, Garback, um, also Marsha Collins, and also Steve Kraus. Amen, and, Vice President. And what we'll do, we'll go ahead and start with um, Steve Kraus from Madam Vice President. Before, Finance. before, before Mr. Kraus uh, uh, starts, too, I also want to uh, thank you for your extraordinary leadership on this issue and the water coalition that you worked alongside to get this legislation through. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. So we'll start with Steve Kraus from Finance. Unmute. Oh, you got. It. He has to unmute. Can you hear me okay. Now, can you now. Hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Kraus, Deputy Finance Director. Good morning, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Um, finance has has responded uh, to this bill, um, and we believe that because the majority of the activity will reside uh, in the Department of Public Works, um, we have deferred to them to kind of explain their program and how they intend to implement portions of this bill and perhaps even some recommendations um, to amend. So with that, matter, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll now move to the Department of Public Works and we'll start with the uh, Acting Director, um, Matt Garbuck. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We have a PowerPoint presentation that um, if I can share that, um, we can uh, go through that. I don't know how that would work okay everyone hold on for one second as we get the power we're going to try to get the powerpoint up okay okay you're now the presenter you can bring it up okay thank you well thank you very much uh madam chair members of the committee mr president um i'm thankful that um i have the opportunity to speak to you about this really important program and I want to talk about what we've done so far and um, also what we are planning to do uh, in the future. As you all know, this is our overall uh, mission for the Department of Public Works. Uh, we usually say it during most of our presentations, but all, everything comes from this mission statement. So we try to make sure that everything flows from this mission statement to support the health, environment, and economy of the city by providing customers with safe drinking water and keeping neighborhoods and waterways clean. Uh, very briefly, I know uh, the council president mentioned it. We have started seeing impacts from the COVID-19 uh, economic epidemic, um, uh, not, not just in the health effects, but also in the economic effects. What we're seeing a lot of is commercial entities and industrial entities are using very little, if any, water. Uh, that means that they are not paying or are going to be getting uh, very large water bills. The rate structure for commercial and residential is different, so that impacts the revenue quite substantially. Also, because of the economic reality of the situation, as Council President and, and others have mentioned, there is going to be less revenue for residents, and that means residents are going to have trouble uh, paying for their water. That is going to probably increase, and we are already seeing that increase. As of now, the Department of Public Works is expecting and planning for a close to 20% uh, reduction in revenue for the fiscal year 2021 budget. This is based on looking at the overall economic indicators, as well as looking at the current uh, reduction in usage and what that would generate in terms of our, um, our planning for, for the future. And all three of our utility funds, the water fund, the wastewater fund, and the stormwater fund, are self-sustaining funds. So any reduction in those are going to have to have some sort of cost containment associated, whether that's on the operating side or the capital side. So I just wanted to frame that as sort of the bigger picture where we are right now as, as a utility. But what we've done, and I do want to acknowledge that we, we I, I acknowledge we missed the April 13th a deadline, and I do apologize to the committee and, and everyone else. We were absolutely working towards that date to have something available. Uh, we, quite frankly, quite honestly, uh, we were we were hit in the middle of uh, March, and everything kind of just fell apart with the pandemic. We all went to remote locations, and, and quite honestly, we, we we sort of looked up, and and 
it, it had already uh, come and gone. And we realized that we had this hearing and we thought this would be a good opportunity to provide an update and, and get some direction on some of the things we needed. So after the legislation was passed and signed by the mayor, uh, we formed an interagency implementation committee. It was a large committee of about 20 to 30 people. It included public works, law department, finance, mayor's office of children and family success, mayor's office of government relations, office of performance and innovation and the environmental control board. So from this implementation committee, <clears throat> we formed four working groups. The first working group was a water for all working group. That was looking at the programmatic requirements the system requirements, the human and capital resource requirements, as well as the financial requirements for implementing the Water for All program. The second group we formed was a group specifically looking at tenants and renters. This has been something that has been very difficult in the past because of the way the department is set up and because of the way the billing system is, is set up. We wanted a, a specific work group to examine um, how we can work and how we can implement the tenant provisions of this. The third group, working group, is uh, dealt with the billing dispute and the appeals process. This was a bit more straightforward. Uh, this was something that we made considerable progress in, and I, I'll go into that in, in just a bit. And the fourth group was a smaller group, but it was looking at how we could study the any alternatives to the infrastructure fee. There was uncodified language that was included to uh, ask us to look into that as an alternative, perhaps something that might be more equitable or, or more fair across the board. And I'll get into that in, in a bit as well. Um, also, I just wanna highlight that last week, uh, in response to the COVID epidemic, the emergency COVID-19 discount program was announced. This broadened the provisions of the current BH2O program. That's the assistance program that's provided that we provide now. Uh, those provisions were broadened to include anyone who's eligible for the state's unemployment insurance. And we believe that this uh, gets a lot of the people who are gonna be very much directly and indirectly affected by, by this economic downturn. So the first group, the first working group that we had was the Water for All working group. So what we looked at there was, again, the system requirements, financial, human resources, all of those different things. So this program uh, requires uh, individual calculations based on those individuals who qualify for the program. Now, I just wanted to raise that there are some system limitations. The current billing system that we have only perform straight uh, calculations based on consumption and can provide a, a overall cost discount. That's what the BH2O program provides, a 43% discount to anyone who's enrolled in the program. The bill requires individual calculations based on those who are in the program. We can do that. The, the caveat is, or the way we would do that is, we would need to have a number of people who we hire and can train to utilize some sort of Excel sheet or some sort of other uh, calculation program that they would then have to individually run the bills that are in the system. That can be done. That can obviously be done very well. We can, we can do that. What that does open us up to is potential errors based on manual calculations or individualized calculations. I just want to put that out there as something that we could have a potential for. And I know we have struggled in the past with, with certain programs and, and certain systems, but that would be something we would need to overcome. The um, other issue is the financial requirements. Um, we would need to hire more staff and we would need to make sure that we develop this uh, Excel tool or this other tool appropriately, which would require some uh, capital expense and some some operating expense. Again, it's something that we can program, but it would obviously have to find those those funding areas somewhere. And the last thing that we really wanted to highlight was how this would relate to the current BH2O program, and that's something we're still trying to work through um, because they are similar yet they are different, and how both of those programs would interact with each other and whether they would be something 
side by side that someone would choose or something that's layered on top or one, you know, the BH2O would, would, would give way to the, um, the water for all program. That's something that we're still, we still need to work through and we don't have a, a firm plan going forward as of yet. The uh, tenants working group uh, was a very uh, interesting working group and it looked at a lot of the issues that we have with tenants. So we absolutely understand as a department, as an administration, that many of the people who are most affected and most at risk in the city are those who, who are likely renting or, or otherwise tenants in some sort of larger facility. The way our water system is, is built and the way our water system is constructed, the Department of Public Works has a relationship with the uh, facility, with the proximity, the premise, the meter itself. So the problem that we've had in the past and the problem that we face is that once we get past the meter, so if it's a larger apartment complex that's on a master meter, once we get past that into the individual apartments or condos or, or, or other uh, uh, living, living facilities, it becomes very difficult to develop some sort of relationship, some sort of direct relationship. Now, if someone is renting a, a single unit, which has an individualized city meter, so this would be a house, this would be um, a standalone house, a, a, a row house, some sort of single family home, that individual can get their name on the uh, water bill, on the account, in addition to the landlord. Now, DPW doesn't have any ability to compel the landlord to do that, but that is an option that uh, the landlord can put the renter or the tenant on the bill. That if the, in that case, the, the program and the, the, uh, the discount can be provided directly. So that, that's something that wouldn't be um, a major problem. The bigger issue that we're trying to, to, to consider is how we work with renters and tenants that are behind the master meter. So these are tenants and renters that we don't have a relationship with and don't have accounts for in our billing system. But that, we are looking very creatively. We want to find a way that we can work and, and find a way that we can work and, and develop some sort of relief for these tenants. Uh, the bill has provisions about, I believe, uh, checks and um, other accounts that can be provided or other discounts that can be provided to these tenants and renters that can be used to pay um, their water bill. Um, we, we look, there are a couple of jurisdictions elsewhere in the country that have done some uh, very innovative ways. It, it uses a third party that has individual relationships with all of the renters, and it requires sort of a, an agreement among the three different entities about reductions. And I can go in more into that if there's any questions, and I'm happy to follow up um, in writing as well. Um, but with the current plan that we're looking at with um, the, the direct payment of, of checks and other credits and all to renters. One of the issues we, we have found, unfortunately, and, and Mr. Krause can, can go into this if there are any questions, is that with checks that are issued, there are tax implications. So the city would have to issue a 1099. Also, individuals would be required to uh, withhold and to document that revenue appropriately. Um, so th these are the things we're looking at right now. We, we are absolutely sure we can uh, work with renters of single family units and single uh, units with a direct meter to get them uh, in the program and enroll them. We're trying to think creatively and trying to figure out how we can actually develop a relationship with tenants and renters who are behind a master meter um, so that we can actually provide the relief that they're looking for. The third working group uh, dealt with uh, billing dispute and appeals. So we've made a lot of progress in this working group. There are draft regulations. Uh, we have them and we are planning on posting them and distributing them as soon as we can. Um, I'd say either tomorrow or Monday at the latest. There are some things that we are still working through. So we're still working through the staffing requirements and the training requirements. For instance, we are uh, trying to figure out what level of um, uh, 
education or experience or background, um, those who are uh, adjudicating or uh, working to advocate on behalf of the customer, what type of background they would need. Would this be a, a legal background? Would this be a public policy background, a finance background? Or is this something that on-the-job training and, and experience would be uh, sufficient for? So we are looking through that, haven't really come to a, a, a consensus on that for the internal side. The other thing is the location of the customer advocacy office. We know that it is within DPW, but we need to put it somewhere within the structure of DPW that ensures that it is effective and actually meets the requirements of, of the law. Now, where would that be is still open for question if, if it's something that's going directly to the director, if it's in the bureau, if it's not. That's what we're trying to figure out. Um, we want to make sure that that is absolutely effective, that it is a strong and forceful advocate, but that it also uh, understands the, the, the limitations and the uh, provisions of law and how the water system actually worked and is calculated. That's something that I think we can have uh, some clarification and some idea on definitely by the implementation date. And, and I'm, I'm fairly certain on that. Uh, the developing um, also of the SOPs, we need to develop standard operating procedures for any of those staff that we do train. So the training and staffing requirements sort of go, go hand in glove on that approach as well. The fourth working group was a smaller working group, and it hasn't done a whole lot because it is a smaller issue, but this has to do with um, an amendment that a uncodified language that I believe Councilman Dorsey proposed to um, examine a, an alternative to an infrastructure fee. So we met with Councilman Dorsey to get a better understanding of what his intention was with that language. And we brought our consultant in who does our financial modeling for us. And we understand um, very well what the intent is that the infrastructure fee uh, is based on the a meter size, so a three quarter inch, uh, a half inch, et cetera. Is this the most equitable way of imposing this standard fee? Is there something that's more equitable? Is there something that's fairer across the board? So we talked to him, we got some good information and the uh, consultant is preparing some modeling and some uh, analysis based on different concepts. I, I think one of them was sort of a front foot fee whereas the, the, the amount of, uh, of um, linear feet that the asset uh, utilizes in front of the house, so if it's a house or property with a large area up front, you know, is that a better and more equitable way of calculating a fixed infrastructure fee as opposed to the meter size? The studies do within one year of enactment, and we will certainly be able to meet that. Um, what's next? Um, so I, I raised some of the issues with the system limitations. Obviously, we can't make the system do something it, it, it can't do. Uh, that being said, there are workarounds. Some of them are, are creative. Some of them are going to require um, some simple fixes. Others are going to require potentially longer term or, or more expensive fixes. Also, there's budgetary implications. You know, where, where do these fixes, where does all of this fit into this overall economic condition that we have. I mean, there's, there's serious budgetary limitations on everything that we can do. And the department, as with everything else, has to prioritize. And where this fits and what we are prioritizing is something we did want to raise and we did want to um, get some direction and some, some feedback from the, from the council and others on. Uh, we are going to post the dispute and appeals process regulations. We want them to be available for comment. Um, and we want a, a full, robust um, exchange of views on those ideas because we really want those to be appropriate and be effective. Uh, we want to resolve those, those issues with tenants behind master meters. That's a real sticking point. And it, it's something we really want to solve because we would be sort of a, 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 a leading city, leading utility in the nation if we can get on an, an innovative approach to really moving this issue forward. Um, and that is going to require some creative thinking and some, some uh, sort of thinking outside the box on how we can get to that point. Um, we also want to solicit outside feedback from the experts, from those who have lived and worked and, and, and pursued these initiatives throughout the country. And uh, we need that to help determine our training, our SOPs, our internal procedures, 
how we're going to effectively implement this. And then at the very last thing, I, I, I'm, we are going to be able to have a lot of the bills in effect by the, the implementation date, but I will say I don't believe we're going to have all of the provisions available to be implemented by the, um, by the implementation date. And I would like to work with um, anyone and, and the council and, and others to see if there's any way that um, perhaps we could extend the deadline so that we can get a better process and a better review um, and a more comprehensive uh, program that, that we can implement that, that meets all of the needs and everything uh, like that. So uh, that is a, a very brief overview of what we've done uh, to date. Uh, there's a lot more in detail that we have. I'm joined by obviously Marsha Collins and, and Mr. Steve Krause from the finance department. Um, I'm very happy now to answer any questions that the committee may have. Did you want to yeah. take that down? Oh, it's coming down. Oh. Well, thank you, um, Director Garbo. You uh, definitely gave us a, a update of um, your progress um, with this bill that has been enacted into law. Um, we're going to. We, I'm sure there are some folks that do have questions, and we'll follow the raise your hand type thing. We'll start with. Uh, um, I don't know if the president is back on, but we'll start with the committee and then uh, we'll go with um, some of the other council members that have um, in, uh, included themselves in, in this hearing as well. Um, I, I just want to start with, and this might be one of the questions, when the bill was being worked on before it became law, um, there were some organizations that uh, played a, a big role in working to help get that together and be a part of that. And um, I think at the end, you did kind of mention that you were going to start including anyone else that was interested. And of course, we do have some strong advocates that represent some uh, organizations that are on this, uh, that are being a part of this hearing. and. Um, I'm sure they have some questions and statements that they want to um, add as well. And from your statement, you did say that you were going to um, start asking people. I'm so glad you have these committees formed with those different topics because it is a, a very intense bill and um, glad that there there is some progress. So at this point, um, we'll start with any committee member. Do you have a question for um, DPW? And I saw um, Councilman Stokes' hand up first. Okay, this question is for Matt. Um, uh, he talked about switching the water bill to a renter that's in the landlord's name to a renter. And I have some constituents call me. That's what they want to do, but. One of the landlords say they didn't want to do that because if the if the land, if the tenant don't pay the bill, they scared that it's going to go on a um, taxation going to the tax sale. So my question is, even though that's a good idea, there's no enforcement. How can you you can't make the landlord put the water bill in the tenant's name? And one of the tenants I'm talking about would qualify for this 48 percent discount, but by the bill not being in their name, the landlord says she did not want to do it because it might go on the tax sale if the renter don't pay the bill. So that's my question. How do you, how do you, you can't, I don't, maybe it's not the right. How do you actually, how do you force the landlord, I don't know if you can force them to put the water bill in the tenant's name when they have them concerns about if they don't pay it, it goes in the tax sale. That th th thank you, Councilman. That's an excellent question. We, we've we've we have faced that. We face that all the time. That is something that it is not mandatory. We cannot enforce that. Um, it is an option. We we suggest it. We uh, want that. We encourage that. But as of as of now, we don't have that that authority um, to to force that. And as you mentioned, you know, landlords do push back. Oftentimes, um, they are on the line ultimately, for their mortgage rates and, and other issues with the city. 
Um, that is something that needs to be considered. That's something we need to work through on that because it is an option, um, but it, it is not a fail safe and, and it is up to the landlord to consider whether or not they want to do that. It is their choice. Well, can I make a suggestion? I don't know if it sounds right real quick, Count on, on sure. Chair. If, if the landlord agreed to put the water bill in the tenant's name, can the city, I don't know if this is a good idea, but give them some kind of discount if they do that to kind of encourage them to move on that? Because again, you just said it, we can't make them do it. Well, if they put in the renter's name and the renter qualifies for the program, there would be the discount. They would get the discount in the bill. So, um, may, may I, may, Chair, may I add to that? Yes, um, Marcia, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Councilman, you're right. Uh, we don't, uh, tenant landlord law is not within the auspices of our Department of Public Works. But as uh, Director Garbark points out, uh, a tenant in that situation would actually be uh, providing uh, we would be giving them the discount and thus that would bring down the bill for that particular property. And in, in the long run, the, the landlord would uh, not, would um, have an advantage in that the overall water bill would be discounted. And if the tenant didn't pay and they had to ultimately pay as the owner, still be at a discounted rate. Yeah. So they're there for a landlord to do so. Um, and I, I think maybe, um, you know, they're, they're missing that point, um, that the discount that goes to the tenant ultimately oh. is an advantage to the landlord because their bill is going to go, their overall bill is going down. Also, we have our portal and we've really pushed hard for landlords to, um, uh, file for the, the portal. They can look every day if they want on the portal water usage, they can see whether or not a bill has been paid. Um, so there are ways in which to give them a comfort level to do so. Um, you know, so one option may be that we can just push out um, the information in the water bills about why it's a, it's a good idea for landlords to designate their tenants. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Um, Councilman Stokes? Just one more question. If Let's say because of the COVID nineteen, they give them a discount. But if they just change the bill over to the the tenant, is there going to be a discount anyway? I'm not talking about what's going on now. If they just change the bill over without this COVID nineteen, and they change the bill over to the tenant, is there is there still going to be a discount once it's switched over from the landlord to the tenant? Uh, yes. So the, the COVID situation is an enhancement that we, we added. The uh, original BH2O program uh, still is consistent based on the income requirements. And uh, so if, if someone qualifies um, for the BH2O program, that, that will remain in effect uh, regardless of the pandemic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair McCray. Director Garbark, you spoke in the Water for All Group slide. You spoke about the system requirements and the financial requirements um, that we would need to overcome. Did we have an estimate, or do you guys have an estimate on how much that would cost? So I. I'll, I know Ms. Collins has some more detail. It's in the realm of about $30 million. Marsha, do you want to go into some of the details on that? Go ahead, um, Ms. Collins. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilwoman McCray, um, the, we have done a, an overall estimate. And of course, in these estimates, uh, we try to be conservative. Uh, we had our uh, consultant uh, look at the Water for All program, and they worked up some numbers for us. Um, give me a second while I pull them out. The $30 million that Mr. Garbark was referring to would be an anticipated um, loss of revenue to the utility for providing these credits. And that's based on the um, 
the um, number of anticipated households who would be eligible. In this case, it would not only be our current customers and any single rental unit tenants, but it would also be tenants behind master meters. So they, since that was different from our BH2O program, they looked at that uh, to um, get a, a general sense based on census, how many uh, households that might be. So that's how they worked up a potential for $30 million uh, revenue loss impact to provide this credit. That's a conservative estimate based on about 50% of eligible households participating, which is a very aggressive uh, percentage. Um, they also looked at the um, cost to um, implement the program. Uh, one of the aspects of the, the uh, Equity uh, Accountability and Equity Act states that if the, if the participant regularly pays their discounted water bill, then that amount, let's say I'm, I'm eligible, I end up paying a, my discounted bill is uh, $50 a month. As long as I maintain and pay my $50 a month, $50 would be with, uh, removed from any um, uh, arrearages I might have on my account. Uh, so based on that, um, they estimated there might be $12.5 million one-time impact in the first year of the program to buy down, in essence, buy down those, those arrearages. Um, program administration costs was another 800,000 estimated, again, estimates, and uh, implementation costs one time of about 1 million. So we would estimate under this conservative process, a uh, $44.3 million impact in the first year and 30.8 per year going forward. Again a conservative estimate based on 50% participation. Councilwoman McCray, any, anything else? Thank you. I just have one more question, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, sure. In, in the what's next section, um, Director, you spoke about the need to speak with experts to just solicit outside feedback regarding the training, SOPs and procedures. Can you speak to me more about what that group of experts look like who does it consist of? Sure, absolutely. Um, it would be anyone um, who can provide some sort of expert input. So advocates, obviously the council, uh, others, we want outside input. We want individuals to um, outside of the department to come in and help us develop those. Uh, we had fully intended to, to bring in outside groups um, and that was where we were sort of on pace for. We wanted to sort of get an in, internal assessment and baseline of our system needs uh, first, see where we are, you know, with, as a utility, as a department. And then, you know, once we figured out what we needed to do, bring in outside groups and experts and advocates and, and the council to, to help build what we, um, what we could do and, and how, what we needed to do. So we needed to understand what we had at first. Unfortunately, we got to March, we were wrapping that up and then the COVID pandemic hit and um, things kind of just, just started snowballing from there. But we absolutely want to work and are intending to work with any group who, who is interested in joining us um, to, to help make this program effective. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilman Henry, I think you had a question. I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Garbark, I'm sorry if I didn't catch this in your presentation. I heard that you said that you will need additional staff to implement the billing program. Uh, did you put in a request for that additional staff in the 21 budget? So we, it, within the utility, um, we have staffing that is, is currently available. Um, so there have been, the utility positions are separately funded from the general funded positions. So we do have um, excess capacity for our utility positions, uh, which would be used for utility maintenance and the building operations in other areas. So we would utilize those, those positions and we wouldn't need to ask for any additional uh, positions to be funded. But they would still have to go through the study and, and review process by DHR to classify them. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, so you're, 
you're going to use existing staff. We have existing open positions that are not filled, that we have a surplus of in the utility that are funded by the utility funds that we can use, utilize. So you're going to use those spots to hire the staff you need to implement the program? That's the plan, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, any other council member with questions? Okay, at this point, we also have, um, uh, I see uh, three advocates that I know have been uh, a part of this formulation of this bill for a long time. And that's uh, Rihanna Eckle, uh, we have Jamie Lee, and we also have Zafar Shaha. I guess I said your name right. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. And also we do have, uh, Hillary Rooley that has joined us in this bill from the law department. The last bill we, uh, we had Mr. Pedro. And uh, before we get to them, I see um, uh, Councilwoman Shannon Sneed raised her hand for a question and then we'll get to the advocates. Thank you, um, Chair, uh, Chairwoman. I just have a question in reference to, I know the um, mayor uh, just implemented a program that we can use to help people get a discount on their water bill as well. But I just wanted to know, um, what do people need to show or to prove that they are unemployed during this time? Uh, great question. Excellent question. Um, that is when the, the state has now unveiled its unemployment website, its portal. It, it's working. They're, they're still working through some, some issues to fix it, that when people uh, register for unemployment uh, insurance, they provide their information. They then get a, a letter or an email stating that they're eligible or ineligible, one or the other. And that piece of information would be what all that would be necessary. So that is to, to if someone wanted to show that they were, in, you know, were getting or were eligible for that, they would have to show that uh, piece of information. The other thing that we are working with the state on is getting a file um, of everyone who is in the city who has um, applied for that and is eligible for that. And we're gonna cross-reference that with our water billing system and automatically put those people in the program. So we believe that's probably a more effective way to automatically get people rather than making them um, come to us proactively to apply for this. Um, so, so that's, we, we're hoping to cover everyone in that, but there's still that, uh, that, uh, ability for them to come and show eligibility to verify that they're in the program. That's wonderful that people will automatically be put in. That's, I think that will be huge, um, to receive that discount. Thank you for that, uh, for thinking. I do have another question. Have people begun to enroll in the different programs that you offer to get a discount on the water bill? Like um, mm -hmm. how many H2O assist applicants, if any, have we gotten during this uh, month and a half? So during the month and a half, we've gotten very little um, for BH2O. However, from we use also a, a, a automatic enrollment from the state because um, the programs are consistent with programs that the state has. So if they qualify for these state programs, they would also qualify for BH2O. So we've been able to get um, files from the state and can automatically put them in the system. I believe there's close to 9,000 people enrolled in the BH2O program right now. Um, and But within the last month and a half, there have been very few new enrollees. Um, I'd have to get information from the CAP Center and the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success as to why that, that is the case. But I think it's just everything is, has sort of slowed down at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Middleton. That's all I have for right now. You're welcome. And uh, so before we get to the questions from the advocate, I do want to mention that count, uh, member of the committee, uh, Councilman Ed Reisinger, has been on all along there. He has been having some technical difficulties, but he is 
uh, a member of the committee and has been on uh, the whole time. And um, and then I, now I see that we have, um, oh, presidents, I wonder if President Scott had any questions at this time, but he looks like he stepped away. So we'll go ahead and start with the advocates and who shall we start with first? I'm, I'm actually, I'm back, oh. Madam President, oh. Madam Vice President. Okay. Sorry about um, that. So that's uh, quite all right. Did you have uh, some questions and a statement? I do. Uh, I do. Uh, my uh, what happened is actually I lost my internet connection in the storm. So I'm sorry, oh, everybody. But that, that's okay. That's what. That's what happened to me. So give me one second. And I don't know, Madam Vice President, if uh, Director Garbach uh, was able to answer the questions uh, uh, from the letter that I sent him. It, or did he speak about that at all? Uh, D Director Garbal, you want to comment? Uh, yes, I think I think um, I think I got to most of those 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 answers. Um, there there are probably some that I I, I neglected to answer. Uh, I can pull that up. Um, yes, sir. And then while while you do that, Director Garbal, uh, when you the working group, and I don't know, I apologize if one of the council members has asked this question already. Uh, the working groups that you have. Uh, on the implementation of the bill, are they all internal working groups, or is there any external partners? They, the, as of now, they're internal. Um, we wanted to get a baseline of where we were as a department, as a utility, what we had, what our system requirements were. Um, but we are going to open them up. We're intending to open them up because we we want and need um, outside input from those who are knowledgeable about these issues and can help us form the best procedures and training and programs. Yep, and then so to that to that point, what, what I would first ask is that when looking at those groups that we would consider adding uh, uh, members of the, the, the wonderful committee uh, that came together that helped us with this legislation, but also when you're thinking about tenant, uh, the tenant portion that we add, you know, both people who represent tenant rights and actual uh, uh, landlords and property owners so that we are, when we're doing an implementation of something of this importance that we are getting and hearing from the people uh, that know best about water, but also that are in people that are impacted on all sides of it as well. Yes, sir. And then I guess I can just go straight into the questions. I don't know if you were able to answer uh, uh, any answer this question because you guys didn't uh, put any draft regulations for the affordable program by April 13th as required by the law. Uh, what is the process? And when can we expect to have those uh, published and when will public hearing, I mean, public uh, input in a hearing be held? So, uh, yes, um, we, we, I, I completely admit and acknowledge we, we, we missed that, that deadline. I, I apologize to that. We were certainly not intending to miss it. Uh, we were working very diligently and uh, the, the COVID situation kind of happened in mid-March and we, we all sort of blinked our eyes and it was already mid-April, quite honestly. So um, it was fully our intent to, to have stuff posted and to be able to post it. Uh, we have draft regulations for the appeals process and um, the uh, resolution process. Uh, we can post them um, anytime. We, we, we can do that. I, I, probably by tomorrow or, or by the latest on Monday, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Um, we can also post this presentation and well as well as some other uh, written documents that we have outlining um, what we've done to date and what we, um, you know, some of the challenges and things that we're still thinking through and that can be done in very short order. And then uh, to that director, Garbach, to, to, Garbach, to that point, uh, uh, to that point, if you guys can post them now, what's going to be the mechanism for public input? So uh, will there be a DPD, DPW be holding a public hearing for input in addition to also maybe setting up an email address where folks can send that in as well, uh, the, the comments and we, we, what I would expect when posting it, if we can post it, you know, work out between today and Monday before you guys post it, like also the time of frame that it's going to be up and comment and when all of that stuff needs to be worked out. Yes, sir. We were happy to. It's, it's, it's very easy to post an email uh, comment 
uh, section where uh, comments can be uploaded, emails can be um, uploaded as well. Um, I can certainly, we, we certainly have been developing internally how we can conduct public meetings, sort of web-based like this with the WebEx uh, or conference calls or other things. Um, absolutely willing to look into that and, and, and happy to, um, to see what we can do. Thank you. What, and also my, my next question is, what steps have you guys taken so far to alter your account or billing software for implementation uh, of, of the bill? And has, have you guys to d develop training, specific training for staff ahead of the July 13 implementation deadline? So <clears throat> we've done some of that. We've done an assessment of our system. We've uh, brought in our consultants, both for doing our modeling, our financial modeling, as well as the, the technical consultants of the EMAC system and the software. We have actually um, learned quite a bit during this, this as we, we have now transferred um, all billing operations uh, remotely, and that has allowed us to um, dig deep into the system and understand some of the things that, that we may not have, have, have known already. Um, we have learned what the system can do and what it can't do. So we, we, we have that. We have a baseline of what it can and can't do. We would need to work on, on other processes to, to find a way to get to the same point, if that makes sense, by what the system can and can't do um, at this point. So we've done that baseline assessment. We've done what, what we can expect from this system. And um, we are working to develop training. That is something we absolutely want outside groups, experts involved in to help us develop that training. Because if there's um, information out there that's been developed and has been very useful, we don't want to recreate the wheel. We want to use what's already been proven beneficial. So we, we really want to work with the outside groups on that. Yes, and I guess just to further go to that. So do you guys think you are going, are you on track to meet the july 13th deadline you're on track to meet uh to have many of the things meet the july 13th deadline but not all of them okay well what i would uh what we want from you uh director uh is let us know by monday which things you guys are on track for and which you're not on track for because we want to get everything on track because the deadline is not for one thing or another is for everything. And we understand the COVID uh, crisis and how it's impacted, but we all need to work together to meet that deadline. You're absolutely right. Yes, sir. The next question for you is uh, uh, the timeline for hiring the head of Office of Com Customer Advocacy and will you commit to uh, uh, some sort of citizen input into that hiring process? Um, so I need to talk to DHR about the procedures for that. I think we've done that in the past. I, I wanna say things have been done to that effect, um, either at the mayor's office or elsewhere in the city. Um, I need to confirm with Director Herbert and um, the other staff if there's any civil service issues, but I wanna say that, that something like that has been done in the past. So it is probably doable. Mm, okay, well, let us know as soon as possible. Next question so, is one of the big promises of the bill of the law is that the cust customer advocates office will be independent of DPW. However, the advocates office is technically still a part of DPW. What are you guys, uh, what rules and practices are you going to put in place to protect uh, the customer advocates, uh, your customer advocates from potential agency influence from DPW or others? Uh, yes, sir. That's a that, very good question. That is something that we have not come to a final understanding about, where that physically is located. And what does that person need to have in terms of qualifications? We want it to be as most effective as it can be. Does that require it being close to the billing system itself, understanding the technical limitations and other issues? Or does that require being further outside of that, being completely separate from the agency. Um, that is something that we need to still figure out because it is absolutely um, important for that. Um, I don't. I know the legal issue is that it needs to be within DPW. It's just figuring out where 
and what sort of position and, and, and type of, of position that would require. I expect to, to be able to fully have that uh, figured out by July 13th, though. But we do want to make sure we get input on that as well. Thank you. And make sure we'll be sure to follow up. Yes. Sir. Uh, the law also requires the oversight committee be made up of the inspector general, the auditor, and the DPW director, the council president, and three city council members. The committee is also required to hold at least two public hearings a year, effective July 13, 2020, uh, with the requirement for the first hearing to be held by the 13th of January, 2021. You, you do uh, feel as though the committee will be created by July 13? Yes, sir. I believe, Great. I believe that that's good. Yes, sir. So and then also, uh, with this piece of legislation uh, going into effect, will DPW can continue to administer the H2O assist program in conjunction with the Water for All program implemented by uh, the WAEA? And how do you plan to coordinate the enrollment process for H2O assist and the Water for All program? Will CAP centers provide assistance to in rural household and water for all? Will the online um, H2O assist applications portal be able to process water for all applications? How are we going to make those things work? That's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's, it's something that is still uh, being considered. The CAP center obviously is, has very limited staff and very limited resources. Um, we have we've talked to them about engaging with with people on this bill and on the, the program. We have not worked with them on implementing it or looking at it. Um, we need to figure out where who will do that and how that will be done. Um, looking at the positions that would be needed to cre be created to help uh, implement the program, they're all within the department right now. Uh, they're within the utility fund. So I would think it would need to be within house sort of within DPW to be able to utilize the system and be able to get and extract that information. The CAP Center basically just verifies eligibility and then submits that information to DPW now for DH2O. But again, how those two processes interact is something that we need, we need to figure out. Um, because, you know, are they in conjunction with, is one on top of the other, or will one give way to another one, um, I think we wanted to hear from folks from the council, from others, you know, what what that perspective was, um, because um, we, we weren't completely, you know, certain about what that interaction would be. Well, this is something that we definitely need to work on because we have two programs that are doing similar stuff. We probably should look at try how we can make things work together or uh, changing the way that we're doing things together so we're not doing duplication or not reaching the people that we have to reach by law because one of these programs is required now by law water for all is required now by law so we have to make things that we have to do the priority and to my last question madam vice president uh, uh well no i have two more uh Knowing that you you said that there's some things that you're falling short on, I know you're going to let us know by Monday what they are. Uh, also, when you're doing that, if you think that honestly that that's going to cre create a situation where you guys are not going to be able to start and fully implement uh, on the day, due date of July 13th, please let us know as well. And then the other two questions I have for you are, are actually COVID related. Um, how can individuals who have lost their job uh, due to COVID enroll in H2O assist and what is needed to prove their unemployment eligibility? Uh, yes, sir. Um, th that, that is a very good question. We, we've gotten that question quite a bit. We are preparing um, uh, mailings that are going to go out um, to, to provide that information to everyone. So the state has developed a new employment system. It has some issues with it, but it is working. Uh, they are having it up every day. People are using it. Uh, generally, whether it is in person or uh, through paper or online, someone files for unemployment, they then receive a um, acknowledgement saying whether they're eligible or not. And it's, it's, basic, it's based on the criteria set out in law. The Federal CARES Act has softened some of that requirement. It's allowed for a longer extension of the unemployment period. 
Um, that would be that, that sort of certification received from the Department of Labor, the state, whether it's an email or a letter, would be uh, all that's needed to show that this person is eligible for it. What we're working on doing, though, to make it easier for everyone is getting a flat file, a, a file of everyone in the city who has uh, filed for and is eligible for unemployment uh, from the state, being able to cross-reference that with our billing system and apply the credit automatically without people even having to apply. But the application is sort of a, a stopgap, a fail-safe, so to speak. Yeah, and to that point, uh, can you tell us how how many applications we process since the start of the state of the emergency, how many receive, how many staff members are working to enroll in people, and will the online H206 application be ready to go live by May the 8th? So let me start with the last one. Yes, it will be ready to go live by May the 8th. Um, there will probably be more enhancements rolled out over time where people can search whether or not they've been input in the system from the flat file. But I don't know if that's going to be on May 8th, but on May 8th, the application itself will be rolled out online. I have no reason um, to think otherwise. Uh, everyone's working very hard. Um, the Mayor's Office of Family and Children's Success has a handful of people. They are working remotely. Um, I don't know the exact number. I want to say it's maybe four or five that are working and handling these issues. They are going in um, once a week to pick up paper, I believe, from the post box, and they're also working remotely. Um, I don't think we've had much enrollment since the state of the emergency, um, but a lot of those who we have enrolled have come from another flat file we got from the state or similar programs um, are, are with eligibility. We just took that information and automatically enrolled people. We have about 9,000 people enrolled so far. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Madam Vice President, you're muted. Thank you. Um, and now we have the three advocates that I'm sure have some comments and questions. And just raise your hand. Who would like to start from those three? Um, I can start. This is Rihanna. Hi, um, Rihanna. Yes. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Middleton, Council President Scott, and members of the committee, as well as other members of the council. Thank you for joining us this morning for this important hearing. Um, thank you for holding this hearing today and for your time and commitment to ensuring that all Baltimoreans have access to affordable and accountable water service through the Water Accountability and Equity Act. Um, I know many of you, but for those who I don't, my name is Rihanna Eckel. I'm the Senior Maryland Organizer with Food and Water Action and the convener of the Baltimore Right to Water Coalition. I want to start off by saying that we understand that the coronavirus pandemic has added a layer of difficulty, uh, not just for the Department of Public Works, but for many city government agencies. But I do want to share some context about the long and tedious history of this bill, which has been years in the making. Um, our coalition convened in 2016 with the purpose of writing and passing a comprehensive water affordability bill through the city council. We started meeting with the council in the spring of 2017 and worked with then council president young staff for a year and a half to finalize the bill language the bill was finally introduced in late 2018 and the committee this committee specifically has spent a lot of time in hearings and work sessions to ensure that we passed a bill that would address the myriad of issues related to water affordability and billing in our city we were truly ecstatic when the city council unanimously passed this legislation in late 2019 and the bill was signed by the mayor in January of this year. And we are, our coalition is especially grateful for the work of the council president and the members of this committee who made this enorm enormous victory for Baltimore's residents possible. So thank you again. Um, everyone that we talked to, council members, advocates, legal providers, and community members, felt the urgency to address Baltimore's growing water affordability problem way back in 2016. And three and a half years and three 10% rate increases later, this is a crisis. Um, Baltimore needs the Water for All affordability program as outlined in this bill now more than ever. Um, as the uh, department highlighted, the program would cap water bills at an affordable percentage of household income and provide a pathway out of water debt as well. I'm sure that you all know that about 37,000 Baltimoreans have filed initial unemployment claims since March 3rd, and thousands more have lost wages. 
Over one third of Baltimoreans were already overburdened by unaffordable water bills before this crisis, and we know that that will only grow. Many households will fall behind on their water bills because of lost wages and jobs, and people will need assistance not only with water bills going forward, but to handle these water debts. This is urgently needed. Three and a half months after this bill was signed into law, amidst a global economic and public health crisis, it's clear that the department needs to do more to ensure that everyone in our city has access to water. Their working groups are a great start, but as Acting Director Garbark mentioned, two weeks ago, the department missed a crucial implementation date when they did not provide draft rules and regulations for the Water for All affordability program for public comment. As I mentioned earlier, we completely understand and recognize that the department is having a challenging time due to the pandemic and the work from home mandate, but it's really necessary that they do everything possible to continue to push this important bill forward and meet the original implementation deadline, because this is something that is a top need for our city's residents. Um, and our coalition has tried to offer assistance in these early stages of implementation of the Water Accountability and Equity Act, and would like to serve as a resource in order to ensure the department can meet uh, key implementation deadlines moving forward. Our goal throughout the last four years has been to make this legislation happen for the residents of Baltimore. And we have been offering resources, connecting with experts and more. Um, and if the department needs anything in order to make this happen, we'd like to problem solve with you. Um, recently, we have connected the administration directly with Roger Colton, the utility affordability expert who presented to the council a few times. We've also connected them with Maria DeCellis, the former customer service director for the Department of Public Works, who now serves as an affordability consultant for municipalities. Um, and we've also con connected them with program administrators for the Dollar Energy Program, who said that with software that they manage, they could get they could help get a program like the Water for All affordability program in this bill up and running in 30 days. Um, we will continue to connect the department with key allies who can ensure this bill gets implemented as effectively as possible, both for the department as well as for the residents of our city. Um, and I think we all recognize that in this trying time, we need to implement bold, innovative ideas to help serve and meet the needs of Baltimoreans. And the Water Accountability and Equity Act is that bold, innovative idea, and it has already been passed. So thank you so much. Now we just need strong implementation. Um, I do have some questions um, that our coalition has been putting together, if now would be an appropriate time to ask those. Go right ahead. Okay, great. Um, let me just pull those up. So um, I think our... First question is, um, has DPW reached out to Philadelphia or other municipalities that have already done aspects of this work? Um, and if not, would they need help connecting to the right folks? Um, I want to say, yeah, Marsha, you go ahead. You, you've been sure. involved in this one. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, my hand raising seems to be frozen. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, yes, and in fact, uh, our um, consultant who we work with on our uh, rate structures was the consultant who helped Philadelphia implement their program. I think it took them a year and a half to implement their program, uh, so we're very familiar. But thank you for the offer, and we certainly uh, appreciate all that you've been doing, and uh, we will be more than happy to, to continue to work with you. Um, as part of our process going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so just notably, uh, your program cost estimates are um, twice of what Philadelphia, of twice of Philadelphia's, and they are a much larger city. Um, their cost for one year of, of implementing this program was 16.4 million. Um, and they added a surcharge onto household bills who were above the income thresholds for the affordability program to cover this program cost. Um, and it was only $1.29 for the typical household. Um, so could you post your cost estimate analysis for our coalition to review? Um, it's just striking that it's double uh, the, the estimate of Philadelphia. Certainly, happy to, yeah. We can yes, we can, we can also do that. And uh, I will say, um, as I prefaced the, the information, um, this is based on a conservative uh, cost estimate of 50% of affected households being enrolled. So uh, we will be building up to that number. Um, and um, I know that many communities 
have not been successful in reaching that kind of percentage, but we want to be sure that we're accounting for everything. We don't want to uh, underestimate and, and not be to cover it, but sure, we'd be happy to do that. Again, same consultant working for Philadelphia and for us in estimations. Great, thank you. Um, and then my last question is, um, why is uh, the department planning to use Excel to implement this program? Um, there are software programs that are specifically designed for this work. Um, Philadelphia has used a billing software um, and that is like flexible and accepts um, a lot of different proof um, for paper documents and online electronic documents. Um, unique applications are generated and assigned a barcode which tracks and monitors the application process. Um, and then they also use a customer assistance management program to compute unique bills for the participants. Um, and two entities uh, have co-developed the software. I'm just curious why the department has said that they would move forward with Excel and um, if there's interest in using <coughs> their, uh, a little more sophisticated softwares. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're, we're interested in anything that, that would, would make this easier. I mean, I think Excel was sort of the default that everyone sort of, if we needed to build it up from the ground level, um, I think that's where we were thinking, um, you know, if, if we just had to do something right now with what we had, that was kind of what we came up with. But but certainly we were we always want to use technology because that, that can streamline all sorts of things. Great, thank you. Um, actually, I have one more question. My last question is, uh, could you specifically highlight which elements you plan of the bill will be uh, ready by the existing implementation uh, date and which pieces of the bill you're anticipating will not be ready by the um, implementation date? Uh, sure. Um, the, the one of the areas that um, obviously those, if, if there are funding requirements, if there are other things that could obviously delay things, but one area where it's going to be very difficult to work out a process and get everything in place is going to be that piece uh, with the tenants behind master meters. That's going to require some uh, very thoughtful and, and very creative considerations. And I, I just don't, I don't believe, and, and Steve Krauss is also on the line uh, talking about some of the tax implications. I don't know if that um, will be able to be up and running by the July uh, uh, start date. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have. I think uh, Zephyr Shaw with Public Justice Center is the next person from our coalition who will just share a statement and ask some questions as well. Okay. Jafar, Safar? Yes, yeah, this is Zephyr Shaw um, oh, from sorry. Public Justice Center. Thank you, Chairman uh, Chairwoman Middleton um, and members of the committee and Councilman, uh, Council President Scott. Um, I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center, uh, a nonprofit civil legal services organization. We're part of the Baltimore Right to Council, Right to Water Coalition. Um, I do have some remarks and responses uh, to DPW's testimony today. Um, one of the achievements of the ordinance is that it encompasses renters as customers in all facets of the law. And under the ordinance, tenants will have the right to obtain account records from DPW to initiate billing disputes and appeals and to apply for the credit and debt relief provisions of the of the water for all program and in those important ways the the water accountability and equity act requires dpw to treat customers equally whether they are homeowners or renters um, and it's i think unfortunate that uh, there have been delays thus far since the bill was passed in making that equal treatment a reality and on time for delivery by July 13th. Delays have consequences and unequal treatment has consequences. And I'll give you an example uh, that, I, that I hope will um, foster a sense within the department of how serious it is to meet the July 13th deadline. About two weeks after uh, Mayor Young signed this bill into law, uh, I was at the district court with my client. We defeated an eviction case brought by her unlicensed landlord. And my client, after the case, described to me that she's still struggling to choose between 
paying her rent and paying her unaffordable water bill. And she recounted to that she had applied uh, recently for DP, she had tried to apply for the Baltimore H2O discount, but it was unsuccessful. And I convinced her that if, if maybe if I go to DPW with her, having an attorney will help with the process. But at DPW in person, we encountered a very familiar pre-WAEA barrier where we were told that my client could not apply for the discount unless her landlord, who just lost his eviction case against her, came to DPW on her behalf. And of course, that's unrealistic. And, uh, you know, I'm, it's unfortunate that she still hasn't gotten any type of discount uh, from DPW in, in the months since then. And even in this pandemic crisis, uh, DPW has not lowered the hurdles for renters. The new emergency provision for uh, H2O was announced last week and all the, all the language in DPW's outreach and press for this uh, emergency discount is about account holders. Um, the language they're using is specific to account holders, and we think it's pretty clear that on May 8th, it's still going to be the case that for tenants to avail themselves to discounts during this emergency pandemic, they're still going to be asking, uh, the DPW will still be asking uh, for tenants to secure the participation of the landlord account holder to make that discount happen. And of course, uh, many advocates for renters right now know that the number one uh, thing on the minds of renters uh, during the emergency is that because they're unable to pay the rent, they're very unlikely to get uh, anything out of their landlord, whether it's repairs, uh, extra time to pay, uh, or let, you know, let alone assistance with uh, programs like Baltimore uh, H2O. I, I think that it's been five months since this bill was passed in city council, and it was an incumbent on DPW to take the timeline seriously to not only draft up regulations, but also the operating procedures and protocols to implement this kind of equal treatment that, the, the, that is in the spirit of the bill, to stop treating renters as third-party beneficiaries who incidentally are paying the water costs uh, and infrastructure costs and et cetera. Um, renters make up over half of all households in Baltimore City, and African-Americans make up nearly two-thirds of those renter households. So let's be forthright about who among us uh, is going to be continued to be treated as second class when uh, DPW doesn't meet the July 13th deadline. Um, the next 10 weeks before the effective day are crucial. Um, uh, we, I think we're all understanding that there are uh, difficult circumstances for DPW staff to be working under, uh, that there are other emergencies, but uh, this, is, this is not a problem that's going away, as Rihanna was saying. Um, on the point of master meter properties, I think we, we've understood and continue to understand uh, what Mr. Garbark is saying, that this is, is pretty much the toughest nut to crack. Um, but to say that there's no relationship with the tenants uh, behind the meter, the master meter, um, I think occludes the fact that there is a relationship with the, the landlords who own the properties that are master metered. DPW knows which properties are master metered. Uh, through the rental licensing program in effect in Baltimore City, uh, which has always been in effect for mass for multifamily properties uh, there is a way for uh, i would contend there is a way for dpw to obtain data from landlords uh, that are master metered about uh, whether they require their their tenants to pay uh, ratio billings uh, of the master meter bill uh, and perhaps, you know, to, to borrow the, the, the term that Mr. Garbrecht was using, maybe there's a way to get a, a, a flat file uh, from those landlords as well about uh, the, the individual households that are being asked to pay water bills. And, and hopefully that's a way 
uh, one of, of different creative ways that Mr. Garbach was mentioning uh, of tackling that problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point, are, are there any comments so far from the committee? None so from the law department, if now is appropriate. Yes, um, Hillary, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to reiterate that DPW's hamstrung in its ability to service tenants equally because state law and Maryland cases make that very difficult. Uh, a 1973 case that we referenced in our bill report certainly shows that the water is provided to the applicant and the applicant by law is the person who owns the property. Sometimes that's not even the landlord or management company. And so DPW, I think, is trying its best to give tenants an ability to have the information. But as I'm sure the Public Justice Center and others realize, um, it is illegal to evict anyone in Maryland who does um, simply um, when there isn't any water at the building and it will remain under state law, the landlord's responsibility to provide water. So if the tenant cannot pay it, the landlord must pay it for the tenant in order to have a habitable uh, residence. And that's um, in uh, the um, state law. Um, it's If the landlords aren't paying for water because the tenant can't pay for it, the obligation still remains on the landlord and they're not allowed to evict when there isn't a habitable property. They're not allowed to provide any um, place for these people to live that does not have running water. And so I think that's something that does get lost a lot in this conversation. It's not simply that DPW isn't treating them the same. It's that a lot of these landlords don't pay for water even when the state law obligates them to, even if they're not receiving it as additional rent from their tenant right now, they have an obligation under state law to provide habitable places for people to live with running water. And so I think that's important to remember. Um, and honestly, it's also very difficult to have um, a separate relationship with the tenants, but I think this bill has found a way to get those tenants that as much of a separate relationship with DPW as the state law allows. But I think it would be wrong for the, the, the committee to forget that DPW simply isn't legally able to provide exactly equal treatment to landlords and tenants. There are state laws that impact that relationship. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Um, and, and then we have uh, Jamie Lee. Hi. Um, un unmute, mute. Are you still on mute? Oh, turn your volume up. Still can't hear you. We're uh, unmuted, all right. Okay. It must be something from your end. Oh, I think I almost heard something. Yeah, okay. The, hi. Still, oh, still can't hear you. Madam Chair, if you like, I can give some instructions okay. on how she can um, get her volume going. In an alternative Hi. fashion. Hi, Mr. Young. Yes, go ahead. Um, Miss Miss Lee, if you could press the three dots on the bottom next to the red X, and then you'll see where it says audio connection. And if you put your phone number right there where it says call me, it'll call your phone and then it'll connect that way. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Young, and thank, thank you, ja uh, Jamie. You can go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. 
Well, my name is Janie Lee. Um, I am a law professor at the University of Baltimore and a member of the Baltimore Right to Water Coalition. And I wanted to highlight part of the new law that we heard very little about today, but that is really crucial. And that's the big picture problem solving and accountability functions of the customer advocate. Um, the law is clear that the advocate does more than dispute resolution, but also focuses on big picture problem solving and accountability. And the bill has these requirements because unfortunately we know that the underlying conditions causing the billing problems are difficult and that they are not going to solve themselves, right? And so um, these other parts of the bill of the advocate's office would ultimately fix and prevent these problems. And ultimately the goal is that this will save money because the fewer disputes there are and the more people can readily and easily pay their bills, the better the economics of the entire billing system. And so we need the independent customer advocates office to focus on comprehensive and customer focused solutions. And we need the new oversight committee to shine the public spotlight on what is happening and what can be done better. And these are um, the public, the, the problem solving and accountability functions that need to move forward. Um, and that can be done even in this time of crisis with the draft regulations and they should be published. And just as importantly, there needs to be an input process where input isn't just collected, but also discussed and seriously considered. Um, the regulations need to include protections for the independence of the advocate's office for it to be effective. And that's more than just where it's placed and what the qualifications are, um, which I know that you were working on. Um, but there's also um, plenty of precedent for how you can um, establish procedures that protect the independence of that office. And we are happy to provide ideas about that. Um, and the regulations also need to support that big picture problem solving um, function of the office. And again, there's precedent on that as well. And so the advocates remain willing to help on all of these issues. And we really thank the council members um, for staying focused on this. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from the committee at this point? And so there's none. So now we're going to move into the uh, some callers, some call-ins. I think there's about five or six. Um, and remember, when you hear the two beeps, um, you know, raise your and also raise your hand. Um, we'll start with caller number sixteen. Caller number sixteen, are you there? We'll move on to the next, which is caller number 17. Caller number 17. Caller number 18. Number 18. Caller number 18. Okay. Well, that's all the callers. So is, is there any of the attendees that um, have some final comments? Raise your hand and we can have some final comments. And I don't see any hand raised. Um, Director uh, Garbark, do you have any final comments? No, I just want to thank you, Madam Chair, and all the other participants and the advocates. Um, the comments, the questions were, were, were um, taken very seriously, and I appreciate the, um, the uh, input, and uh, I, I will commit to the, to the committee and to everyone that we will reach out. We will be very inclusive and transparent as we move forward with this and uh, work together to, to, to find the best way to implement this. Thank you so much, um, and I want to thank you all for participating this truly is a very important um,
bill that we must con continue to push forward. Um, we're going to uh, put this hearing in recess and, um, and, uh, and at some future date, we would just want to come back for some follow up of uh, some of the things that were uh, asked of you, uh, Director Garbo and your team. And um, you'll be hearing from us at a, at a later date. So uh, at that Certainly. point, at that point, I um, just want to thank you all for participating and um, be safe and healthy as we continue to push uh, a lot of very important things, uh, especially during this pandemic. So again, everyone out there, be stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank this you, Madam Chair. The meeting is adjourned.